Hi all, uh, thanks for joining us for Cats for AI. Uh, as, as, you might have know, as you might know, we finished with the introductory lectures, uh, which were the official part of the course. And uh, we're now hosting an occasional scheduled guest talk. Uh, so um, we're back with the, we're back in, can you hear me by the way? Yeah. Yes, okay. Jules. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry. One second. I had some issues. Right. So uh, con we're continuing in March with two guest lectures, and uh, today we're happy to have uh, Jules Hedges on. Uh, Jules is uh, an applied category theorist, uh, a lecturer at the University of Strathclyde, and uh, a founder of the CyberCAD Institute. Um, his work, his uh, his work is on the intersection of uh, game theory and various types of learning, uh, deep reinforcement and invasion, and using category theory as the glue. So today he's going to give us an overview of, of, of uh, this new field. So uh, really Jules, uh, take it away. Okay, thanks. Um, and I should say, okay, first of all, I should say my internet connection may be unreliable. And if I drop out for more than a couple of seconds, please tell me that I dropped out for more than a couple of seconds and where I should go back to. Um, okay, um, so, Categorical cybernetics is this thing that maybe you've heard about. I mean, if you follow basically any of us on Twitter, you might have heard of this thing. Um, and it might sound a bit mystical, and that's basically our fault. So what I want to do is just demystify this thing. Um, okay, so this slide contains the names of not everybody who has contributed ideas to this project. This contains the names of people who I'm currently working with actively. Um, also, everybody who is in the MSP group is currently on strike today, um, so we are not actually representing the university today. Um, um, so most of these people are in Glasgow. Um, Toby Smythe, who's working at uh, Versus, which is a, a machine learning uh, company, uh, is also based in Glasgow. Um, Philip and Fab are my co-founders of 20 Squares, which is our startup, which is using compositional game theory in um, in basically cryptocurrency, uh, modeling of protocols and this kind of thing. Um, and then there is the Institute for Categorical Cybernetics, aka the CyberCAD Institute. And I'm going to come back to that at the end and talk about what that is. So that's basically a, a kind of map of all of the people in this space. Um, until I get to the um, the references slide at the end, I'm not going to basically name names for who is working on what. Um, many people are contributing to many things, um, and there will be some references at the end. Um, so first of all, hang on, I want to get our oh, computers are happening. Um, I want to get Zoom kind of out of the way. Okay, that's slightly better. Um, for some reason, for some reason, my mouse just isn't appearing. This thing is normally this software is reliable. Um, so first of all, let me talk about the word cybernetics. Um, the the um, the ah okay. I just a second. I what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to a new internet connection, which will be more reliable than this one. Um, is it the same? Um, the same. It's it's a different name, but the same password. Ah, okay. Sorry. Okay, I couldn't have done this earlier for reasons. Sorry. I'm just going to uh, reconnect to something that will definitely not drop out. Um, so it's. Can you point? Uh, yeah. Uh, should say is that you? Ah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Okay, it's not appearing. Okay, I guess I'll give up. Oh, um, all right. Um, okay, sorry about that. Um, I was hoping to get a more reliable connection, but it's not going to happen. Um, so th the thing about the word cybernetics is it's completely drifted and completely lost any semblance to its original meaning. Um, cybernetics has absolutely nothing to do with biotech. Um, basically, sci-fi writers just like hijacked this word to mean something else. Um, 
what cybernetics means is something like the control theory of complex systems. Um, so you have systems which are complex, aka they are a complex of systems. They're made of several subsystems which are coupled together. Um, and also um, you, you want to control them. You want to control them in a way that is kind of aware of their, their compositional nature, which is what it means to be a complex system. Um, the other thing that cybernetics means is that it has a strong impression of being interdisciplinary. This was a kind of vaguely utopian time where people from many different fields were just sort of actively working together. Um, and so the idea of categorical cybernetics kind of, it, it sort of began as a meme that it just like, it sounds cool, cybercat. Um, but eventually I kind of, I realized that there is really no alternative word that means this. There is kind of the systems theory and there's control theory and, 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 and things like this, but nothing quite captures, um, the original meaning except for the original word. Um, and by the way, where the, um, where the, the word comes from is Greek is the Greek word Kubernetes, which means, um, it means the helm of a ship, which if you know what the logo of Kubernetes looks like, that should not be surprising. Um, but more generally, it means governance. So the, the, the helmsman of a ship is like governing the ship. Um, for categorical cybernetics, that there is two different things this could mean as a kind of general meaning and a specific meaning. Um, and I'm I'm going to entirely focus on the specific meaning. Um, so the, the general meaning would be basically doing anything that smells like uh, category theory to do anything that smells like cybernetics. Um, but I'm using this in a much more specific way that there was a very small, very small collection of categorical tools, this lenses, um, the power construction, things like this that keep coming up over and over again. Um, so when I say cybercat, I basically mean the study of the theory and applications of that small collection of tools. Um, a take which I like is that this is really about chain rules. So not just the chain rule, but chain rule like things, things that are structurally like the chain rule. Um, so um, Cybercat is approximately a bunch of specific examples of chain rules, of which the actual chain rule is one, plus a bunch of general categorical theory of chain rules, uh, plus um, basically uh, uh, computer implementation of these things, general purpose computer implementation of these things. Okay. Um, okay, I'm very much hoping that everybody here um, actually I haven't, because I don't have a mouse because my computer is just like doing funny things. Um, um, I have no idea how many people are in the audience, but, um, <laughs> it could be anything from like three to 300. Um, um, so hopefully everybody here has at least a vague memory of the previous talks from this series. Um, I am intentionally building on top of these things. Um, so I'm gonna go very quickly over the theory. This talk is supposed to be a high level kind of survey talk, and I don't want to focus any technical attention on any particular thing. Um, like basically every slide of this talk could be expanded into an hour long talk by somebody. Um, so a, a lens is a thing that goes between pairs of sets and it's going to, I mean, I, I've defined it here. It's a thing that consists of a, um, a forward pass and a backwards pass, which have types like this. Um, so the forward pass is just an ordinary function, basically. And the backwards pass is a, is a function the other way, uh, but it has this additional dependency on the kind of forwards input. And the key thing about lenses is they compose by the chain rule. So this, this is the lens the lens composition rule is, oh, I wish I had a mouse. I need to point at these things. Okay. Now I have a mouse. Like, can everyone actually see my mouse? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Could you see my mouse before? No, uh, no. Okay. Perfect. Okay. You can see the same things that I can see. All right. I'm just going to run this thing in, um, in non full screen mode. Cause it's just 
like it's not working for some reason. Um, Apple in shambles. Normally this software is reliable. Um, so this is the lens composition law. Um, so it says that um, if we have a lens from XX prime to YY prime and another one from YY prime to ZZ prime, um, and then we want to say, so obviously the forward pass composes just by forward, by ordinary composition, ordinary function composition. Um, but for the backwards pass, uh, if we have some, some X and some Z prime, we need to get an X prime. Well, okay, so you can do this by type directed programming. So we need to do a, um, to get an X prime, we need to call it F prime. And we need to call that on the forwards input, which is X. And then we need a Y prime where we can get Y prime from a from G prime. Um, and then the key thing is that G prime needs a forward in, input, which we can get from F of X. Um, and this is just like, is the, at least the reverse mode chain rule. Um, but then this definition, it turns out makes sense in any finite product category. Uh, I've written this in, in as though it's like functions of points, but you can, you can make sense of the definition in any finite product category. Okay. Um, so obviously like, okay. Hopefully everybody here knows like the basic idea of, of deep learning. Uh, so uh, the go-to example of this is, um, is backprop reverse derivatives. Um, so uh, oh, hopefully I haven't made any technical mistakes. It's quite likely I've made a technical, at least one technical mistake somewhere in, in these slides because I was writing them in a big hurry. Um, but um, so if you have a smooth function, then you can get its transpose Jacobian, um, which says if we give an input and then a, say, a tangent vector, and I should be correct and say cotangent vector on the output, then we get a cotangent vector on the input. Um, so I've written this as a function. It happens to be linear in the second argument because, um, well, derivatives are linear in the derivative argument, um, and it's nonlinear in the first argument. Um, and then you have a chain rule which says which says this. Um, hopefully I've got that correct, but it may not be. Um, and, um, so what this is exactly saying is that the transpose Jacobian is defining a functor from the category of smooth functions to the category of lenses. So, um, this is saying, um, every, every smooth function you can map it to, you can send it to a lens, which is the same smooth function as the forwards pass paired with the transpose Jacobian for the backwards pass. And then functoriality is saying that um, if you compose two functions and then take transpose Jacobian, that agrees with doing it on the, um, the individual ones and then uh, composing them by composing them by the lens composition law, which is this. Okay, I'm going over this very quickly because um, this was covered in extreme detail in in past talks in this series. Um, so this is this is like the foundational idea of both differential geometry and backprop. Okay, so probably this is not surprising. Here is something that might be surprising: um, is that basically the story goes through completely unchanged for Bayesian inverses. So. Um, a Markov kernel, so a Markov kernel is basically a um, a probability distribution on y given x. So it's a it's a basically conditional distribution. Um, you can you can view it also as a function that for each x will output a probability distribution on the y's. Um, so categorical probability um, basically studies these things. These these form morphisms. The, the, these things collect into being morphisms of categories. Um, and there's a thing called a Markov category, which is an axiomatization of how basically categories of Markov kernels ought to behave. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be extremely informal and just say there is such a thing as probability. Uh, that there are, of course, details because uh, there's different notions of what probability can mean. Uh, finite support, measure theoretic, Gaussian, this kind of thing. Um, so here's the thing. Um, so we can think of F. So I, I can think of F as kind of like a a, a machine 
that I can stick in X inputs and it will give me back Y outputs, but like probabilistically. So if I if I um, keep sticking in the same X over and over again, it will not give me the same Y every time, um, but, um, but the Ys it gives me will form a well-defined probability distribution. Um, and the, the Markov property is saying that this only depends on the current X I'm giving it. It has no memory. It doesn't depend on anything else. Um, now, um, suppose I switch my perspective and I'm now observing the output of this machine. So I'm, I'm observing the Ys that it gives me as output, but somebody else is supplying the Xs and I can't see them. Um, so the standard basic problem of Bayesian inference is suppose that I have a prior belief on how the, on the distribution that the X's are coming from, but I'm observing the Y's. Um, each time I observe a Y, I should basically be able to update my belief of, of the distribution that the X's are coming from. Um, so in particular, uh, if I have a, a prior distribution on X and I observe a Y, then Bayes law gives me a way to define a posterior distribution on X. Um, and it turns out, so, okay, um, I should define, I need to define what it means to compose two, um, two of these kind of stochastic processes together, but it's the obvious thing. Um, if you think of these as machines, as I stick in an X, I randomly get a Y, and then I take that Y and I stick it into the next machine to randomly get a Z. Um, if you want to be precise, this is actually defined by integrating out the Ys. Um, so there is a there is a rule. This is composition in a Markov category. Um, the the uh, probability of Z given X is the sum or integral over all Ys of the probability of Y given X times the probability of Z given Y. Um, and I can do two things. I can compose these things and then ask, what does Bayes' law say about posteriors for this thing? Or I cannot compose them, and I can talk about um, what does Bayes' law say about uh, posteriors of the individual things. And it turns out that these are exactly related by exactly the chain rule, just the same one. Um, so like, this is this is much much less well known. Like somebody knows this, but this is this is I don't think at all well known. Um, so this is so just like. This saying transpose Jacobian is a function from smooth smooth functions to lenses. Um, this exactly says that Bayes' law defines a functor from Markov kernels to lenses. Okay. Um, all right. Um, uh, let's change the order of these. That should be there. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, I'm. I'm. This talk is necessarily going to jump around topics a bit randomly. Uh, yeah, I think I'm. I'm about a third of the way through, and about a third of the way through my time, so that's good. Um, okay, uh, I'm. I'm jumping around topics, or I'm going to jump around topics a bit randomly, uh, because this is supposed to be a survey talk. So in particular, I'm going to jump basically back and forth between things that are sort of application-y and things that are very theoretic. Um, so these are these are kind of application-y things. Oh, well, I mean, they're, they're, application, they're, they're kind of applications in the sense that they are talking about specific, specific instances. Uh, this is not a proper application in the sense that we're not actually doing anything useful with it yet. Um, I'll come back to that point later. Um, but it's like not pure category theory, right? Okay, um, so the next example of things that compose like lenses um, that I'd like to talk about is value iteration. So this is something that um, really comes from, say, classical optimal control theory, um, but it survives more or less unchanged into reinforcement learning. Um, so suppose we have a Markov decision problem. So what this means is that, um, so a Markov chain would be a set of states and then a function that says for each state we're in, then we can, with a fixed probability, transition to some other state. And then 
you kind of start this thing in some state and then stochastically it's going to run and generate an infinite stream of states. Um, so a Markov decision problem is augmenting this in two ways. The first way is that we have also the transitions depend on some action. So say some controller gets partial controller over, over what transitions this thing will do. And then the other thing is that when it does a transition, we're going to get some kind of reward. Um, and the, the optimization problem for the controller of a, of a Markov decision problem is basically to choose actions in a way that will maximize the long run reward. So the, the basically the sum or the discounted sum of all of the real numbers that we get back. Um, a, um, a particularly useful subproblem of this to solve is computing a thing called the value function, which says for each state, uh, what is the the long run uh, the long run value of being in that state if you kind of continue optimally. So the reason this is useful is that this reduces what looks like an infinite horizon optimization problem to a kind of one shot optimization problem that uh, if we want to know what state to go into next, where well, we go into the one which has the highest long run value. Now, so um, typically you want to kind of estimate the value function over time uh, by, by repeated interaction, uh, which is to say you're doing some form of reinforcement learning. Um, so there is a rule called value iteration, um, which basically says that if we have a current, so VI here is, is a given estimate of the value function. So it may not be the exact value function, but it's a it's a um, it's an estimate of it. Then this formula is going to define a um, a better estimate. So it's this is vi plus one is the next estimate. Um, so here in a state, we're going to choose an action, and then stochastically that's going to give us a new state and a payoff. And then the long run value is going to be the payoff we get now plus the value of the next state. Um, and then we have this extra factor beta, and this thing is the discount factor. So the discount factor basically is controlling our preferences between getting value now versus getting value uh, later. Um, or if you prefer, it is a mere trick to make the, the value function converge because it's an infinite sum. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, there is here, there is a floating A, which I haven't defined. So A, A here is sort of coming out of nowhere. Um, and different ways that you can choose A, the, the action basically going to co correspond to different flavors of reinforcement learning. So one thing that you could do is that you could always choose A to be the thing that maximizes that, that maximizes this thing given, given VI. So this says that we basically, we choose A according to what we currently believe is the best the best known action for the current value function. Um, but there are other things, for example, you could be explicitly learning a value function and a policy alongside each other, in which case uh, this A is going to be drawn from the policy. Okay. So what does this have to do with lenses? Well, um, it turns out that um, you can package a Markov decision problem into a lens that looks like this, where the forwards pass is basically saying uh, how the policy is going to change the state. And then the backwards pass is basically saying um, how we transform how we transform our, our values. So, um, and I'm being very informal here, and there's a good reason I'm being very informal, which I come to in a couple of slides time. Um, so the forward pass is saying that we change to a new state and the backwards pass is saying, um, given the current state and the value that we get for all possible. So this is the, the long run value of the next state. This is kind of the, the, the total payoff we're going to get for all stages after the current one. Then this is saying that uh, long run payoff for all stages, including the current one, is the payoff we get for this state plus discounted continuation payoff. Okay. Um, and I'm the reason I'm hand waving is that S prime and U here are not 
independent. They are being drawn from this joint distribution, right? They're, they're exactly the two outputs of, of, of our transition function. Okay. Now, it turns out that um, if you look at what does it mean to be a lens from SR to 1.1, one, one, um, it turns out that lenses into 1.1 one, one are exactly functions from this thing to this thing. Because um, if you think about it, uh, the forward pass goes from S to 1, which uh, necessarily is, can do nothing. And the backwards pass goes from S times 1 to reals. So that's just a function from S to reals. Um, this is a general fact about lenses, which is often useful, but here it's completely central. Um, and it turns out that if we have our estimate of the value function written in this form, then precomposing it with the lens composition formula is exactly the value iteration rule. So that's what this is basically saying is that value iteration is a form of the chain rule. Okay. Um, and I've done this for value functions, which is kind of the, the classical optimal control way of doing it. But basically the same idea works for key matrices, which are um, action value functions. So that would say that V is also a function of, of A, this action. Okay. Uh, this point I want to, um, well, for one thing I need to speed up because I'm slightly behind time now. Um, but I want to jump to talking about th some theory. I possibly I should ask questions now, maybe. Or sorry, ask four questions now. Uh, this might be a a good point to pause. Nobody wants to say anything. So uh, I think we didn't, we don't have, uh, so we did not enable the ah, voice access okay. for participants, but if people have questions, they can ask them in the chat. And so far uh, there seems to be no questions. Okay. I mean, there should be questions because I'm going extremely quickly and I'm like, I'm glossing over like the majority of the details here. Um, okay, so so here I'm talking about basically specific examples of, of things that compose like lenses. And I'm focusing on so there are things there are things that that there are other things that compose like lenses. I mean the the obvious one is state is state updates, which is the the thing for which lenses as we know them were originally defined. Um, and there's a few other things as well, but these are, I guess, the big ones in um, in AI or machine learning. Yeah, I should say machine learning rather than AI, which is, um, so this is basically deep learning, variational learning, and reinforcement learning. That's, I guess that's like roughly the pillars of machine learning. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the theory um so i defined um lenses in a in a finite product category but there are so there are lots and lots of um of like small variants of lenses there are like you can you can modify this definition in quite a lot of different ways um while retaining the essential idea that you have a forwards pass and a backwards pass um and well, for one thing, the, the terminology for these things is absolutely awful. Um, it's it's just an absolute mess. Um, I I have a mind to go on a kind of personal crusade to um, just throw away all of the terminology and start from scratch. And I want to call these things like chains because they compose by a chain rule or something like that. Um, but that's a a controversial point. Um, in particular, there is um, such thing as dependent lenses. So it turns out that if you want to allow your backwards pass types to depend on the forwards pass values, um, that is totally possible. Um, so in, in like pseudo-agda, you would write the type of your backwards pass like this. You input 
a forwards input which we call x and you in, you have a, a backwards input which is indexed the type is indexed by f of x so each value of f of x can give you a different type here and then you would output backwards thing which is indexed by x um, and once you've done this like the, the, informally the definition of lens is still just works like you you do literally the same thing um this allows you to talk about for example branching um uh, depending on values you can like branch into different like branch into different worlds where the backwards pass will give you back different things depending on where you went um okay um which of course if you're doing if you're doing differential programming this is this is normal right you you branch you, your program branches on some values and then like different things come into scope and you're just going to get different gradients back and then you have to you have to deal with that um so it turns out so um you probably heard a bunch of talks about the category poly um david spivak talks about it a lot for example um and it turns out that the category whose objects are polynomial functors and morphisms and natural transformations this is the category poly this is an equivalent category to the category of dependent lenses um this is a a non-trivial equivalence this this fact um they're not they're not obviously equivalent um the the big gotcha is that in poly the polynomial functors the the things that give the category its name are the objects whereas in dependent lens world the things that give the category its name are the morphisms so dependent lenses behave like natural uh well corresponds to natural transformations between polynomial functors these are the same thing um the TLDR of this is that in order to define this in a in a category, you need quite rich structure. You need like uh, locally Cartesian closed, basically. Um, and what you get back is is this like incredibly well behaved, rich mathematical structure. Um, but the 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 demands on the kind of input category to be locally Cartesian closed. This is a strong requirement, right? Most of the categories that we work with most of the time just don't have this there are standard ways to get it so for example um you would go if you um like euclidean spaces doesn't have this for example but maybe you go to like diffeological spaces or something there are standard tricks um and you can go further you can generalize this all the way to these things called f lenses which david spivak defined which is really defined by just just a category and a functor to a category and a functor to cat um, which is just an absurd level of generality um, at that point, basically everything is a lens. Um, this, this, I call this an over over generalization, but this is a occasionally useful viewpoint. Um, let's go the other way. So this version is basically if we put if we take the definition of lenses, if we put in more stuff, we can get more stuff back. On the other hand, we have optics where you put in less stuff, but you get well not really less back you get the same back um so optics um work like lenses but instead of requiring finite products you only need a monoidal product um and it turns out that this is so general that like you have to work quite hard to find something that's not a monoidal category in, in an interesting way like everything is monoidal um but in particular categories are markov kernels this is the kind of go-to example of Things which are non-Cartesian monoidal categories. Um, the the non-Cartesianness of, of Markov kernels basically says, um, for example, if you roll a dice and then write down write down your roll twice, um, you get a different distribution to if you roll two dice. So that's the the non-Cartesianness is that a joint distribution isn't determined by its marginals. Um, there's also this point that even if you have a Cartesian setting um optics basically um they're they're operationally better if you want to implement these things um i haven't i'm not going to define optics because well it's a little bit complicated and people have talked about it before um but um optics are basically in in a sense better than lenses even if you have lenses um so tldr optics are basically just better than lenses in every possible way there is I don't think there's any real reason to use lenses. Um, so in practice, we use optics for everything. Then we have this question. So 
we have dependent lenses and we have optics and we these are both generalizations of the same thing which is lenses so you can ask kind of how can you complete the diamond what is a a um, common generalization of both things which gives you the best of both worlds so from optics we would like not being not requiring cartesian structure and also the kind of better operational behavior and from dependent lenses we would like at least some of their richer structure but especially a way to deal with branching um so um a partial answer which does sort of some of which which basically does this but in a not completely satisfactory way is to compute the coproduct completion of optics not the free coproduct completion that's easy the the, the non-free coproduct completion um so that's one way of doing it that gives you kind of set indexed branching um and then so working out a a fully satisfactory answer to this question has basically nerd sniped us at Strathclyde for two years now um and I think we nailed it finally maybe but it's not written down yet <laughs> I lo <laughs> lots of people have been thinking it's, it's not just us lots of people have been thinking about this question um it turns out to be an yeah, outrageously difficult question okay I am now halfway through my slides and two thirds through um, my time. So let's see how this goes. So, okay. So there's a thing called the power construction. So in any category, in any monoidal category, you can talk about parameterized morphisms. So you say that parameterized morphism from X to Y is going to be a morphism that looks like P times X to Y, where P is some other object of parameters. And it turns out that this construction synergizes incredibly well with lenses. So if you if you apply this this construction to categories of lenses, because an object is a pair, so what we get is this. So um, if you think about what a lens like this does, the forward pass is a parameterized map p times x to y, and the backwards pass is p times x times backwards y to backwards p and backwards x so what this is saying is that your forwards pass is going to depend on a parameter your backwards pass is going to also depend on the parameter but it's going to give you back as well as a backwards output it's going to give you back a kind of parameter output um so in particular you can if this p is being controlled by somebody this P prime, the backwards P is the feedback that goes back to the controller. Um, so it turns out that this, I mean, para, para plus lenses is a very mathematically minimalist setting. You you need almost nothing in to define this thing. Um, and it turns out that this is a very good general theory. I mean, very abstract, but very general theory of what you call controlled processes. So processes which are bidirectional and they have a controller and they give feedback to the controller. Um, and these things have a have a compositional structure. I should have drawn pictures. I I these slides are like arguably unfinished. Um, it would have been better with more pictures. Uh, but you can compose these things in the usual way. But you can also kind of couple controllers to them, and the controllers are just more lenses. Okay. Um, uh huh. Yes, what Bruno said. Um, so, okay. So the first example of this, which I didn't write down because I think everybody here has probably seen it before, is going from just backprop to backprop plus gradient descent, which is to say you have a smooth function which is also parameterized, and then when you differentiate it you want to get back not just a gradient on the input but also a gradient on the parameters and then that's the thing that you gradient descend on um i didn't write that down because i think everybody knows this at this point um here's a much less obvious thing which is doing the same thing for variational inference so i think the the main difference between um between backprop and variational inference is that in backprop 
the thing that you're trying to learn, the thing that you're fundamentally parameterizing is the forwards pass. You're, you're learning a forwards function by parameterizing it. And then the backwards pass is a, is a thing that you kind of compositionally tack on uh, in order to compute this thing efficiently. On the other hand, in variational inference, your forwards pass is basically given. And what you're trying to do is learn the Bayesian inverse. Um, Bayesian inverses are typically computationally hard to compute because they're integrals. Um, so what you will do is that you will parameterize the backwards pass of this thing, and then you'll have a loss function that says, how close are you to being the actual Bayesian inverse? So there are there are loss functions that can do this. Um, you've probably heard a bunch of people talking about the free energy principle, which is um, basically taking one of these um, one of these loss functions and then just like going to town with it, basically. Um, so it turns out that um, you can do variational inference kind of locally. It's, it's pretty much exactly the same algorithm as back, 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 backprop and gradient descent, but instead of backpropagating derivatives, you're backpropagating Bayesian updates. Um, uh, a, a take I have on, on um, how backprop is or what backprop plus gradient scent is doing is that you have a um, you have something which, um, as given, is an extremely high dimensional optimization problem. I mean, in a in a large neural network, is like billions or trillions of dimensions, and um, what what the backprop algorithm is doing is basically decomposing this extremely high dimensional optimization problem into a bunch of individual lower optimization problems by kind of shuffling around the losses in the right place and then these these lower dimensional optimization problems for example uh it's improving the parameters for one individual layer um, that you can do by gradient descent um and so what it seems is that you can do basically the same idea for vari variational inference that instead of computing bayesian inverses for some big very complicated thing depending on lots of parameters you can do something that's structurally like backprop to decompose this into lots of smaller problems, uh, which which are individually much easier to solve. Um, and where we're going with this is to work towards what's called active inference, which is to say what this basically means is that your forwards pass is no longer given, but you're learning learning in some sense the forwards pass and the backwards pass at the same at the same time. You're learning to both act and also infer so you're kind of learning to um to both act on the world and perceive the world at the same time okay um this is my this is my conspicuously unfinished slide uh, funnily enough this open games is the one thing that i am known for inventing and this is the one slide i haven't finished um so you can view open games now as basically parameterized optics plus one other thing which is kind of counterfactual optimization which is a a thing that's unique to to game theory um so um the way that optimization happens in game theory is is fundamentally quite different to how it happens in machine learning um that kind of you you'll do each individual agent is controlling some some part of the game's behavior, which is kind of what they can control through their moves. And um, each player is individually, instead of doing something like gradient descent to move towards the optimum, each player is jumping directly to the optimum. And that's kind of counterfactual optimization. Um, but everybody's doing this mutually. Um, so the TLDR of open games is that you have you still have a forwards pass and a backwards pass, where the forwards pass is basically the play of the game. The, the, the moves are happening, the rules of the game are saying how the game changes state. And the things that are being back propagated are payoffs, but in particular counterfactual payoffs. So things of the form, what would my payoff be if I made this other move? Okay, um, I don't want really to talk about open games in theory. I only want to talk about them in practice. <coughs> okay. So we have, so open games are, are 
And for this talk, Open Games are by far the oldest idea. They've been around since 2015 now. Um, so now we have basically a fully working open source implementation. Um, so what there, there are several layers of this thing. This is a um, it's a it's an implementation of the kind of the back end theory. This is um, optics optics over a category of Markov kernels plus well the optimization parts. Um, but the other thing is it's it's a domain specific language for specifying these things. Um, so this is a whole other thing which I could talk about for an hour. But there is a domain specific programming language with a variable binding syntax. Um, how this looks in practice is that it's something like a model checker for Bayesian Nash equilibrium. So it's it is it is not right. Category theory cannot compute Nash equilibria for you. If it could, then P would equal MP, um, and we would have different problems. Um, so this is a basically a model checker where you put in proposed Nash equilibria and it will tell you exactly why it's not a Nash equilibrium. Um, and what we have found in practice is that this is way more useful than it sounds, especially if you parameterize this thing and then loop over parameters. Um, having a bunch of parameterized strategies and then being able to say like, what are the bounds in which this, this thing is an equilibrium? Um, turns out to be super useful. Um, so 20 squares, we actually, we're, we're using this thing for like, real real world stuff and by real world stuff i mean like other people's problems not not some toy stuff that we made up um the open game engine suffers from specific drawbacks and there are kind of two classes of drawbacks some is that haskell was a arguably suboptimal choice um and then also um there are issues in the design of the DSL. So um, say we would probably do this thing a bit different next time. Uh, at the moment, this is totally usable for us, as as I said, but um, it turns out that almost everybody, so the, the, the DSL has an explicit backwards pass. So you have kind of two, two scopes. You have the forward scope, the forward pass scope and the backwards pass scope. Um, um, this is not what differentiable programming languages usually do. And it turns out there's a good reason for that. Um, because like apart from like three of us, virtually everybody finds programming with an explicit backwards pass to be just like brain melting. Um so you have basically some variables that come into scope and remain in scope forwards, and then other variables come into scope, but they're in scope backwards, which is very strange. Okay. Um <clears throat> Um, we also, we bolted on basically, uh, multi-agent reinforcement, uh, multi-agent queue learning onto this thing. Um, so this was used by Philip, uh, to study algorithmic collusion, um, which is to say, uh, how, how markets will equilibrate if the, if prices are being chosen by, um, <clears throat> by queue learning agents. Um, it turns out that this is a this is a hot topic in economics right now. Um, so yeah, technically speaking, this is um, an extension of the Open Game Engine, which has a backend in Python's RLlib. Uh, so that's uh, this is this is currently closed source, but it will be open sourced at some point in the future. Um, <clears throat> okay, that's a bunch of practical stuff, and now I'm going to jump back to theory stuff. Um, but I'm going to try and. I think I should skip over some stuff. Okay, so there is this thing called Digestic Open Games, which is a terrible name, um, and this turns out to be very categorically deep. And um, <clears throat> what this is is something like extending the functional reality from optics to parameterized optics, um, but it also makes a lot of stuff make a lot of sense. Like somehow it contains the pure essence of Nash equilibrium. Um, at the moment, something I'm working on is basically the next generation open game engine, where I'm trying to take lessons learned from this and a few other places. Um, no longer specialize its game theory, but make something which in theory can do any of these things I've been talking about. Um, and also uh, do a, a deep embedding so we don't have to maintain a parser anymore, because it turns out that's a huge pain. Um, so this is currently being prototyped 
being prototyped in Haskell, which I already said is was a bad idea, but uh, doing this in a way which it could be done in basically any language. Um, so this is work in progress. Um, only partially works so far. Now, uh, okay, is it okay if I keep going until um, five? Uh, so by or... schedule, you have about six minutes. I suppose you're asking to do a bit longer. Uh... Is that including or excluding questions? Questions would come after. Uh, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Okay. So here's the stuff that I spend most of my time worrying about, not the technical details, but the so what. Um, like, well, why are we doing this stuff? And in particular, why do we think this stuff is so exciting? Why do we think this is worth giving a whole name to? This is kind of a, a tricky question. Like, all of us have this feeling that we've um, we've kind of stumbled on a core idea like a, a kind of nugget of uh, a nugget of something really important. Um, but somehow this is also weirdly difficult to justify why we think this is so important. Um, so part of the problem is that and in applied category theory, almost anybody can tell you this, which is that categorical methods basically can't do anything that's genuinely new. There is very little that you can do with category theory that you can't do without category theory, right? Um, now you can always just strip out these methods and do it by hand. Um, it it obviously category well obviously category theory does act like a kind of way of organizing your thoughts, which is um, more valuable than it sounds when you get like a hundred papers a day on archive. Um, there's also there's an interesting distinction between what I'd call practical compositionality versus the the mathematical theory of compositionality. So by this, I mean applied category theory. Um, but the thing is that so in compositional game theory, open games were pretty much the first compositional account of game theory in any way. The fact that it involved using category theory to achieve this is somehow irrelevant. Um, we are using open games to do stuff that like nobody else has done before. Um, but in machine learning, this is different because in machine learning, you already have practical compositionality since forever, right? Uh, the people doing the original perceptrons knew totally well that you can just like plug layers together and this thing will still, the theory will still work. Um, so for a lot of the the machine learning stuff, this is basically taking a form of compositionality which everybody understands already and attaching fancy words to it. Um, whereas in game theory, we're actually giving something practical. Um, the the open game engine lets you do modeling in a way that just like isn't possible before. Um, so that's the kind of interesting point. So for for everything apart from game theory. The, the so what question is a lot harder. Um, <clears throat> one thing we're definitely doing is virtually everything here is folklore, right? I, or I, I would go as far as to say that of all of the application stuff I said, everything is known to at least somebody. Um, like there is, there is, I don't believe we've come up with anything that's like completely new. Um, like finding anybody that's actually saying stating the 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 chain rule for for Bayesian inversion is like it's hard to see it written anywhere, but like somehow people know this or some people know this. Um, but we're we're pinning down things that are cause sort of things that people vaguely know that things look like each other, but in a precise way. Um, and that is a valuable thing to do. Um. The question is exactly how valuable is it? Um, so one hope is is um, giving a general purpose implementation. So this is a kind of once and for all um, kind of bidirectional program language that can do all of these things. We just plug in different libraries. Um, in particular, I think clearly um, differential programming has the most work and the most 
kind of optimization applied to it. So I'm hoping that we can take the the all of the hard work done by people to make differentiable programming go super quickly and efficiently and use that to do things which are not differentiable programming. Um, use it to do this other stuff. Um, also, I didn't get round, down round to writing this point down, but I'm hoping that um, at some point, jumping between these different versions of these different things that you can do with parameterized lenses, the fact that we can talk about them on a uniform foundation eventually is going to lead to like something that wasn't done before. So there are instances of, instances of this which like already are completely commonplace, right? If you go up to somebody and say, oh, we have a theory which has told us how to combine deep learning with reinforcement learning, you're going to get a slow clap. Um, but maybe there is some combination of these things that nobody has put together yet. Um, these are hard questions. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I haven't left myself enough time to talk about the Cybercat Institute, um, sadly. So I, what I should do is leave this on the screen, but um, this is me and Philip Zahn's scheme to basically try to organize better than we can in the university. So we have a few ideas. Um, one is to have research researchers and or math, well, let's say, yeah, theoretical researchers and software engineers on an equal footing instead of one telling the other what to do. Um, we're sort of not academia, not business, but somehow trying to trying to look at both and take the best parts from both and leave the worst parts from both. Um, an example of the reason you kind of need to do this. Um, some people ask, like, why why is the private sector so far ahead of universities in working on machine learning? And the answer is, well, you try and get funding for DevOps on an academic research grant. Like, it's it's not really feasible. Um, so yes, um, I should have left myself more time to say this, um, but we are actively actively looking for funding right now. We're kind of in the process of, of uh, applying for grants and things like this. So um, if anybody wants to talk about this, I'm extremely happy to talk about this. Um, I've overrun by one minute, but here are some of the papers that basically say some of the things that I've talked about. Um, so there is these, and there is these. Um, I'll leave this one on the screen but I can flip back to this one if you want. Okay, now we should definitely stop. Uh, all right, uh, thank you, Jules, uh, for the talk. Um, we're now going to move into uh, questions. So if you have a question for Jules, please uh, write it in the chat, or uh, if you're on YouTube, feel free to write it in the chat as well. We're going to forward these questions. Uh, and we already have a question from a teacher, if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Um, uh, who says, and Jules, I'm not sure, can you see the question I, yourself? But, yeah, I can. Right. So the question for people uh, in the audience is, uh, so uh, I have a suggestion. Have you tried thinking about GANs using this idea of open games, uh, fixed points, natural equilibrium in terms of practical machine learning? Yeah. So I, I haven't used the Zoom panel feature before. So should I actually press answer live to go through each one? Uh, we'll we'll take care of that. You can just answer okay. the questions. Yeah. So, um the answer is is kind of and actually bruno has thought about this considerably more than i have um definitely this is a this is a extremely folkloric idea that gans are doing something like nash equilibrium this is almost certainly written in the original gans paper i guess um that um that something like this should be possible um but say making this precise so mapping from, say, neural networks to, so mapping from, say, a category of open uh, of neural networks to a category of open games, functorially, um, this is this is very much a thing that's on the to do list. Um, that's one of those things that sort of definitely seems obvious and easy at first, and and I think that some of the details of that are going to be a uh, much more of a headache. Um, but yes, it, it that's for sure a thing on the radar. Uh, 
uh, can I ask a practical question? Yeah. Uh, you, you you mentioned that uh, in, in in your twenty squares uh, company, you are solving actual people's actual problems. Um, could you say something about what these problems are? Um, I would prefer not to because I haven't um, checked in with Philip to say to to check what I should and shouldn't say on a public and recorded thing. Um, Maybe like what's the domain or something, uh, or if so, you can, that's also fine. But I'm just yeah, very so curious. I mean, it's it's. Um, So, I mean, the, the the general idea is that this is looking at um, game theoretic aspects of smart contracts. So, there are so um, there are kind of software bugs in smart contracts where they can go wrong for basically programming reasons. But there are also what you might call economic bugs, where the thing works as intended but has what you might what you might call um, misaligned preferences or something like this um, and especially a lot of people want to do things like auctions uh, which are notoriously difficult to get right okay thanks a lot well we wait for questions i have i have a question of my own um which is right so, so first of all you covered like a lot of ground uh yeah possibly too much i wanted to cover basically everything right which is yeah certainly a, a thankless task in in in, in one hour uh yeah. and every one of these slides is so this could be expanded so my question is could you give a few meta comments about the state of the art of the field currently um and in here i mean something about its age size where do you think it's heading where do you think, what do you think are the obstacles? Because from my experience, uh, it is not even well known to most people uh, that A, there is there are these kind of unifying efforts between this arguably different types of learning. Well, you know, it, this is probably known and people are trying to do this, but perhaps B, that this is founded in some quite abstract, but in, as you try to substantiate quite uh, in ways practical mathematics. So yeah. given this, that people that these people don't know much about this effort at all. What do you think? Yeah, it, it might be good to give some general comments about the state of the field, meta comments. Yeah. Um, the first thing I would say is that we, so this is a balance between theory and, well, let's say category theory and not category theory. And at the moment, we have way too much waiting on the category theory side. This is just, the nature of the people, <laughs> the nature of the the small set of people who are working on this thing, um, enjoy getting nerd sniped by the the, the purely theoretical questions. Um, so we need definitely a lot more a lot more work on the on the on the not fully category theory side. Um, another, I could say. Although it looks like there's a lot of us, but there's a, a lot, lot more things to be done. And actually, some some of these things are technically extremely difficult. I've skipped over all of the reasons that they're extremely difficult, um, but we don't have enough people, basically. Um, um, my oh god, uh, ah. okay. Um, my my roadmap for this is i mean what what i was saying on this like big picture slide this is this is kind of me struggling to to come to terms with this or get my head around it like where where are we actually going um my basically plan is to focus on computer implementation this is i think a relatively understood recipe general recipe and applied category theory for how to make your thing useful is like get a computer to do it and then give that implementation oh the drilling started again that's nice um um basically implement it and then give the implementation to end users um my experience is that this is not enough because 
if you if you just give a piece of software to end users, they will ignore it and keep doing what they already know. Um, so theory people have to get their hands theory people have to get their hands considerably dirtier than most theory people would like. Um, I can't really. I I wish I had a better a better story for this. Um, this is like we we have this we're in the situation where we have a bunch of theories like oh all of these things are basically the same thing it's like yeah, we all know this has to be useful for something but actually um like delivering on that seems to be much harder than than we expected it's like who 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 actually needs to know that uh, all of these things are structurally the same uh Maybe most people would, would agree that it's interesting, uh, but maybe wouldn't agree that it's interesting enough to say give us funding to to expand the number of people working on this, for example. Um, it might be that I'm being very pessimistic, but that's probably because I've had a headache all day. Um, Is my connection still alive? It's it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's certainly a hard thing to um, imagine where this is going to go. Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, this is the last chance. Um, if there's no other questions. Um, I think this is a good point, given that we're also ten minutes past uh, the twelve o'clock. Uh, to thank Jules again and. Uh, uh, and remind people who are still here uh, that uh, next week uh, we have a talk from David Spivak uh, also on Monday uh, at um, this time, a slightly different time. It's going to be at 5 p.m. UK time, so one hour later. Also something that might impact be impacted because uh, there's a daylight savings time in, in the UK as well. So we'll be sure to post the exact time that it's happening. But next week is David Spivak who's going to talk about uh, dynamic organization systems. Uh, and since there's no other questions, uh, I think this is just a good time to say uh, goodbye. Uh, thanks, Jules. <laughs>